who is joining us on the YouTube ministry. And uh, I'm hoping everybody can hear and we're ready to go. Now, we are studying the book of Isaiah and uh, we are making, we have progressed through to chapter 13. Chapter 13 is going to have some rather interesting things involved in it that I want you to see. Now, we are at the point where we're going to enter a new part of Isaiah's prophecies uh, here in chapter 13. Chapters 1 through 12 tended to be about Israel, uh, and we need to understand really what's going on in those first chapters and then in this new set. But before we go any farther, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the time that we could spend together. I thank you for the time that you have invested in each of us, the forgiveness you have provided to us, the salvation you've given to us as a free gift just if we'll receive it. But now, Father, I pray that you open up this book of Isaiah to us today, and especially chapter 13, that we can understand what it is you're trying to tell us. I pray that you will enlighten us in this regard. And I finally pray, Father, if there's anyone listening to me today who has never received personally Jesus as their Savior, that if they're here in the room, they'll come talk to me afterwards. Or if they're listening at YouTube, uh, they will email us or send us some kind of notice that they would like someone to share with them how they can come to know you in a personal way and have a personal relationship with you. I pray all of these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. In the time of Isaiah's ministry, uh, who was in control of the, or who was the dominant force in that area of the world? Assyria. If you said as Assyria, you're correct. Let me show you the Assyrian Empire. You can see Jerusalem down here. But all of this green here, up, up here is where their capital is, right over here on Nineveh. Uh, they controlled Babylon uh, and all these areas and reached down all the way almost to, to Egypt. Now, they didn't control Egypt. Egypt was still uh, a, a competitor, so to speak, uh, but later to become an ally. But uh, Assyria was ruled by some rather aggressive monarchs who were uh, about colonizing uh, the Middle East under Assyrian control. They were quite cruel and barbaric. And uh, if you were another nation state at the time, you had to make one of two choices from a practical point of view. You either had to submit to Assyrian rule and taxation, or you had to try and cobble together a group of alliances where you would be strong enough to stand against Assyria. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel chose the cobbling together of an alliance, and they failed. And during this time, we've observed that God will use both the enemies of Israel and sometimes even their allies as a rod of discipline. When God's people turn away from him, there are always going to be consequences. Now, God's purpose was not only to turn his people back from their uh, wicked uh, temptations, but to teach them that no enemy, no enemy could prevent God from protecting them. No enemy is able to, strong, to stand against Israel as long as Israel has God with them. And that goes on, that principle, throughout history, which should alert us to this fact. Discipline is coming to America. Discipline is coming. There are some people who say, oh, no, no, that's not going to happen. You're just trying to scare people. It came... Now, I want you to think about this. 
Israel had to stay in Egypt for 400 years, God's people as slaves. Why? Because the sins of the Amorites were not yet full. And then God was going to use Israel to punish the Amorites for their sin. Then God's people came to the point where they rejected him as their king. They wanted a, an earthly king, and the kings got worse and worse and worse. And finally, their sin became so grievous that God said, All right, northern kingdom, I'm sending Assyria. And in 722, they uh, destroyed the kingdom of, of Israel, and they scattered the people throughout the whole world at that time, or the then known world in that area, never to return. Judah saw that, witnessed that. Their prophets explained to them what was going on. Assyria came down to attack uh, Judah, and God miraculously saved them. And when I say saved them, he basically killed all the Assyrian army. And the history books will tell you that they've covered it up well. There was a problem back in the capital, and so we had to return. And we had to stop our siege. Yeah. Now, but later, Judah continued in the sin, grievous sins, sins that were just horrific. And uh, as a result, God said, all right, I'm sending the Babylonians. Now, I'm going to be soft on you, though. The Babylonians are going to come in in 606 B.C. and they're going to defeat you, but they're going to allow your king to remain in power. And they're going to allow you, you can just act as a vassal state or as a colony and everything will be fine. And sin continued. And in uh, 597, the Babylonians came back again. They deposed that king. They put in a new one and they said, you're going to follow these rules. And if you don't, and they said, you know, we don't have to do what those thinking Babylonians said. And in 586, came back for the last time, destroyed the nation, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. There was not one stone left on the other as they tore it apart, this beautiful Solomonic temple. Israel thought, well, that could never happen. That's God's temple. They didn't listen to Ezekiel. He said, you need to understand. God left that temple a long time ago. And so here we are in that kind of situation where Babylon hasn't come yet. In fact, at the time of Isaiah, uh, he wrote probably around 740 B.C., his prophecy, his book. Babylon is not going to really come to power. That is the second kingdom of Babylon. They call it in the history books Neo-Babylonia. Uh, it's going to come to power around 626. So that's more than 100 years in the future Babylon will come. And uh, we're going to see in chapters 13 through 23, he's not going to talk about Israel for the time being. He's going to talk about these other nations, and the one he's going to talk about the most is Babylonia. Now let's look at verse 1 in chapter 13, if we can. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Now, the first thing we want to do is look at this word oracle. Do you know what it's translated in in the King James? Burden. Burden. Now, that doesn't sound anything like oracle to me. But you look at this word, it's Messiah in the, Greek, in the Hebrew, and it means an utterance, an oracle, or a burden. Well, those two, burden and utterance, don't seem to be the same thing at all. But if you were to look up in, uh, say, an English dictionary, the fourth meaning of the word, English word burden is the main theme of a speech book or argument. So this is the concept that he's delivering here. Now, I think we should understand this word here to mean something that is weighty, Solomon, Solomon, solemn and grievous in its uh, tone. That's what he, that's what this is saying. This is not good news. This is bad news. 
Now, I want you to look at this verse, and I want you to tell me which type of communication is it? Would it be something that was described as something written that was given to uh, Isaiah? Was it something that was not written but was spoken or oral given to Isaiah? Or was it like a video given to Isaiah? Why would you say video? Because of the word saw. Now, if you look it up and say, well, maybe it doesn't really mean that. It means exactly that. He saw it. He looked at it. Now, we're going to need to remember that uh, as we go through because we want to think, this isn't something God told him. This is something God showed him. And it's going to be amazing. Now, let's take a moment to look at this history of the nation of Babylon. Neo-Babylonian Empire um, was the initial world ruler. That is, it controlled all of the the area then that was civilized at the time uh, of Israel's time in the land. The first one to do that, its capital city was Babylon. Like I said, it started really in 626 B.C. And that empire ended (coughs) under the attack of uh, uh, the Persian king uh, Cyrus the Great in 539 B.C. And here we have... Hezekiah writing about this empire more than a hundred years before it came about. Uh, it's did I, who did I say? No, Isaiah. I need corrections from time to time. That's one of the reasons I married Julie. But uh, <laughs> you're exactly right. It's Isaiah writing about this. He first started writing during the reign of Hezekiah. Now. The founding king of Neo-Babylonia was a guy by the name of Nabopolassar. And Babylonian, the Babylonians really were known, the, the basic people group of Babylon were the Chaldeans. And they were divided up into a number of clans that uh, they called bits. But Nabopolassar was not only a, a good king and military guy, he was also a great diplomat. And he brought all those clans together and reinstituted the kingdom of, of uh, Babylonia, which had long progressed for about 100 years after a very strong original king named Hammurabi. Now, slowly but surely, he believed in... Uh, Babylonian expansionism, and he started working and cobbling together certain uh, alliances that they would go on, and he formed an alliance first with a group called the Medes. Uh, The Medes probably were the ancestors of the Kurds in Iran, and they formed there, and they would attack, he would attack Assyria and Assyria cities, and he started taking more and more ground away from uh, Assyria. And then, uh, subsequent to that, he made another alliance with a group called the Scythians, and they were involved when he was able to take the city of Nineveh, which is the capital city of Assyria. And so they started to grow. The final real battle occurred at 610 B.C. when the son of Nabopolassar, who was leading the armies at that time, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Historians want to refer to him as Nebuchadnezzar II. uh, Defeated Asher Ubali, who was king of Assyria and his Egyptian uh, allies at a town called Haran. And so we begin to see this coming uh, and growing of Assyria 120 years after the time that uh, Isaiah wrote about him. Now, there's an important question that I have wrestled with this week. If you look at the Scriptures, you will see that God brought Babylon to attack Israel to punish them for what they had done and for their sin and their betrayal. In this passage here, Isaiah is going to predict God punishing Babylon for what they did. No, wait. 
God's bringing them and then God's punishing them? Well, first blush doesn't sound real fair to me. But who does God use in something like this? Someone who already has evil in their heart and God just helps, allows them to, not helps, but allows them to express it in the way that meets with his purposes. Well, wait a second. You know, go back to the map just a second. Does anybody know what this area of the world that goes like this is called? The Fertile Crescent. Israel's way over here. Babylon's way over there. You don't go across this when you don't make it. You have to go up and... Why would they give anything about Jerusalem? Well, let's look in a passage during the reign of Hezekiah when Isaiah first started his prophecy, found in 2 Kings 20, starting in verse 12. At that time, Barudak Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon. Now, at this time... Babylon was small. It was basically a city-state. It was just Babylon. It didn't have anything else. Assyria was everywhere else. And this small city-state, this, this guy, uh, the son of Baladin, who's the king of Babylon, heard that Hezekiah was sick and could be dying. And he was sick and could have been dying. Well, he sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah listened to them, to them, that is the messengers, and showed them all his treasures, all his treasure house, the silver and the gold, the spices and the precious oils, and the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasury. And there was nothing in his house, nor in all of his dominion, that Hezekiah did not even show, did not show them. He's also going to show them the treasures of the temple. Let me show you. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did you say to these men? And from where have they come? And Hezekiah, oh, they have come from a far country. Uh, they have, have come from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah said, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. And nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons will also, who also will issue you from you, who you will begat, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. One of those uh, offspring may have been named either uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, or maybe more than one. But uh, then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, now catch this, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, if it, is it not so if there will be peace and truth in, in my days? That sounds like a guy who came from England in 1939. And what did he say we were going to have? What did he bring back as a gift from talking to Hitler? Peace in our time. Now, I think there was a bit of arrogance involved in what Hezekiah was doing here. And what does God say about pride? It always comes before a fall. Um, now, I'm going to tell you, it appears to me, if you read everything, that Hezekiah was a good king. But maybe he just wasn't one of the sharpest knives in the drawer. And he created the motivation for Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar to invade Judah in 606 B.C. They wanted it. They wanted all that loot, uh, all that money. And the nation state that Isaiah spent most of the time on in this book, he's going to talk about is Babylon and how God will use his chastening rod in regard to the evil 
festered in the southern kingdom. But finally, uh, he is going to talk about his chastening of Neo-Babylonia. And so we start with the oracle in verse 2 of chapter 13. Lift up a standard on the bare hill. Raise your voice to them. Wave the hand that they may enter the doors of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones. I have even called my mighty warriors, my proudly exalting ones, to execute my anger. Now, we need to stop right there. And I want to ask a question. Who is speaking here? God is. Now, you need to understand he's not talking about Israel or Judah. He's talking about Babylon. Babylon. Well, who is he going to bring to fight against Babylon? The Medes and the Persians. Are they going to have a king who is going to become a godly king? Who you probably will meet one day. Cyrus the Great. How did Cyrus the Great ever hear about Yahweh? One word, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel is going to be the one who ministers to him and shares with him. And uh, we don't have time to go into all the great things that Cyrus the Great did for Israel. But he's talking now. He's going to execute his, his anger. A sound of tumult on the mountains, like that of many people. A sound of uproar of kingdoms and of nations gathered together. And the Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. And he is coming from a, they are coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, the speaker in this passage is the Lord... And he's giving a prophecy about something that's going to happen, not at 740 B.C., but at 539 B.C. And he showed Isaiah that there would be a gathering of nations and armies for the specific purpose of destroying Babylon. Now, some people may be upset with me for using, for being rather strong in these statements. But the final king of Babylon was an idiot. And he, it appears, set about to destroy his nation. And when he's at the most perilous time of all, he calls the biggest party you've ever seen. No, I did not say that. And how dare you speak the truth like that in here. But we need to... No, I'm serious. We're not going to talk about politics. I want to talk about Babylon. And we need to see it. Now, the picture of the ensign being raised to rally the troops here is the same thing that was used in uh, chapter 11, verse 8. And they're being gathered to destroy Babylon. And the ones being brought to Babylon, being used by the Lord Almighty, are not godly at the time he's bringing them. They're simply mission oriented by the Lord God. That's what he's doing. Mission oriented. These people are going to come and do my will. They're going to destroy Babylon. And this coming destruction is not just of the city of Babylon, but its entire territory and influence. And now we're going to see a description of what happens to Babylon. Why would God write this? Well, one reason he might tell us these things or tell initially Judah these things because they're going to see what Babylon does to them and then they're going to see what happens to Babylon and knows that God is going to at least pay back it starts out with the word wail wail what does that mean cry out in pain and torment and horror. That's what this word wail means. Wail for the day of the Lord is near and it will come uh, as destruction from the Almighty. Now this is a long passage but I think we need to read it all to start with to see what it's saying. Therefore all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. 
They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel and fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud, and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. And I will make mortal man more scar- pardon me, mortal man scarcer than pure gold, and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. And it will be like a hunted gazelle, or like sheep with none to gather them. And they will each turn to his own people, and each will flee from his own land, flee to his own land. And anyone who is found will be thrust through, and anyone who is captured will fall by the sword. And their little ones also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, and their houses will be plundered, and their wives raped. Pardon me, ravished. The accurate word is raped, but sometimes the translators want to smooth it over just a little bit so that it doesn't sound as coarse. Uh, And yet that's not the word God used. After looking at this, I want you to see something. All of these things that it's talking about did not happen in 539 B.C. and following. They didn't. There was some of these things that happened, but most of them did not. Now, is there... Has there been a Babylon ever since? No. In fact, we're going to see that Babylonia, the, there's coming a time when there, the city of Babylon for a long time has not been inhabited. And there are s- some people who are thinking about trying to rebuild it, and there have been efforts made to rebuild it. But... Yes, there was an area referred to as Babylon, etc., that, for example, uh, where the Jews came back from uh, after the captivity. Also, if you read in uh, the books of First and Second Peter, you will see that Peter sends greeting from the church in Babylon. Now, some of you want to say, that, no, 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 no. Peter didn't go to Babylon. He went to Rome. You see, he was the first pope. No, he's not. If there was a designated leader of the first church, the first century church, it would have been James, the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. When they had the great convocation uh, to talk about what was required for salvation for Gentiles, who was the chairman of that meeting, and who made the final decision? James. But Peter was the apostle to whom? The Jews. Like Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, the leading. And when I say not, that doesn't mean the sole apostle, but the leading one. Well, at the time of Jesus, where were the majority of the Jews residing in the world? Babylon, they didn't come back. Only about a fifth of them came back. And we need to understand that. And so, as we go forward here, I want you to see this. And we got to come to understand. You see, after using the first five verses in this chapter to relate to us the narrative of the fall of Babylon, he's now going to provide us additional information as to the day of the Lord. And we need to see this. During the tribulation period, that seven-year period, the last part of the Jewish dispensation, will there be a Babylon? Yes, there will. In fact, if you think about it, 
and I'm trying to understand and try to understand this, there will be three centers of power in the world at that time. Three centers. One, Rome. Two, Jerusalem. Three, Babylon. And Babylon will be a religious center, a mystic religious center. And the mystery religions of Babylon will be brought back. And what is this religious system depicted as in the book of the Revelation? A whore. And what color is she? Scarlet. And she'll be riding on the back of the beast, who is Rome, with the seven horns, I mean with the seven heads and ten horns. Vera. You mean Europa riding on the back of a bull? You think they just made a mistake in doing that? Of course they did. They were very innocent in that regard. But now, let's look at some of the results that we find in this passage uh, on the day of the Lord on the earth and its inhabitants. There are seven that I see. All hands will go limp. Why does a hand go limp and not function? Could be pain, elimination of nerves, things like that. Every heart will melt with fear. Terror will seize the people. If you look in uh, Revelation chapter 6, especially near the end, you'll see where it describes that same thing. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at each other aghast. How is this happening to us, they will be saying. And their faces will be aflame. Now, I looked at this. What does it mean? Their faces are on fire? I don't think so. Uh, it could be inflamed or red because of embarrassment. It could be some sort of chemical burn or from what the sun has done. They would be sunburned to a great extent. But this description is, doesn't sound like fun to me. It sounds horrible. And, of course, it will be. Now, verse 9 starts out on the destruction of humanity. Now, let me ask you. Are there groups in our world today who want to reduce the number of humans inhabiting the earth? Do you know how many approximately humans we have on the earth today? I heard 8.5. I usually go with 8 because it's easier for me to divide and do calculations with. Now, the book of the Revelation says that half of those people, let's say 8, so 4.25 billion, are going to be killed. Now, these other people who oppose God... How many do they want left? Instead of four and a quarter billion, 500 million. They were blown up. Why would somebody want to blow them up so you couldn't see those? Yes. So one of the purposes for the tribulation known as the day of the Lord will be the death of wickedness and the ones who practice evil. That's what this passage is saying. And during this horrible time, there will be blackouts. Now, are we talking total eclipses of the sun? No, we are not. We are talking in total eclipses of the sun. Has anybody seen a total eclipse anytime recently? <laughs> Could you see? Was there plenty of light to function? I drove during that time because I had to get back to work. Julie's unhappy that I did, but that's okay. She, I do a lot of things sometimes that she doesn't particularly want me to do. But like ride my bike yesterday. But be that as it may, we're talking not about the sun being covered by something and the light coming around it. We're talking about blackout, total darkness. Is it just now, here again, what part of the earth had the effect of that eclipse? that we saw. Small part. We're talking about the whole earth. Dark. Now, 
I asked myself, as I was studying this week, how many times is that going to happen? Well, I came up with uh, five blackouts in and around the day of the Lord. The first one will occur right before the tribulation starts, and that's recorded in Joel 2.31. The second one will happen during the first quarter of the tribulation. It's in Revelation 6. The third blackout will occur during the second quarter of the tribulation. That's in Revelation 9. The fourth one will occur in the second half, sometime during the second half of the tribulation period. God doesn't say exactly when he's going to do it because he wants it to be a surprise, I think. But in Revelation 16, the final blackout happens right at the end of the seven years of horror, just before the return of Messiah, recorded in Joel 3.15 and Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Now we're going to come in verses 11 and 12 to speak of this death of a large part of mankind. The Lord will greatly reduce the human population on the earth. In fact, to the point that God says human beings on the earth will be rare. Rare. Now, it's interesting. In verse 12, if you look at some translations, it will use the word man twice. Uh, in this translation, it uses the word man first, and then it translates to mankind second. Now, that is two different words in the Hebrew. With two different carries two different meanings. The first one, the word man there, is the word Enosh. Pardon me. Enoshi. Enoshi. And Enoshi or Enosh means a, a mortal man. It carries the idea of weakness and mortality. Man compared to God's other creations like the angelic beings, can be easily killed and destroyed. And that is one of the things that's going to happen. The second one is the word Adam, uh, from where Adam got his name, Adam. It means man or mankind, and it speaks of man's humanity, not his goodness. Some people want to tell you, oh, in every human being, there is a divine spark hidden in there, and if it's just fanned enough, that person will become righteous. I can think of a lot of words to describe that as, but I'm going to go with baloney uh, <laughs> under this uh, setting. But uh, we need to understand that and what is going on. Then the Lord God informs us that the heavens will not escape this devastation. That includes, now, how many heavens are there? From God's perspective, there are three. Number three is the abode of God. Number two is the universe. Number one is the atmosphere that surrounds our earth. Both one and two are going to be seriously affected by going, what's going on. Obviously, if the sun and the moon and the stars are not shining. Now, now think about this. What is the sun? It is a ball of gas that is a self-containing fire. It just keeps burning. It doesn't stop. It doesn't go out and start again. It never stops. And it keeps regenerating itself. The same thing is true with every star basically in the universe. And all of a sudden, they're all going to stop. Can you think about that? Now, with some of these stars... It may not stop. The light just may be interrupted. If it takes, you know, uh, so many years for the light to get from that star to us, he may just interrupt it. But now, could God do that? Now, I want you to think about this a second. Dawn, how long would you say the earth in its present form has existed? A little over 6,000. Let's say between 6,000 and 6,500 would probably be accurate. Now, there are stars that he created that are out there that the light can't get here in 6,000 years. Can't, it can't, it's traveling at, at 132,000 uh, miles a second, but still can't get here. It takes light years to get here. 
So how could we see those stars if we've only been around for 6,000 to 6,500 years? Evolutionists will tell you, well, that's a perfect proof that what the Bible said is erroneous. Now, if you were to look in the book of Genesis, it says on day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. What is light? Well, it's, we best describe it as a combination of waves and particles on those waves because it, it behaves like both. But so when he created that light, he created the sun, moon, and the stars, right? No. He didn't create the sun, moon, and the stars until the fourth day. So all he did was create light. In motion, you begin to see, they're wrong, those evolutionists. God created light without a light source, ethereal light, because he can make it happen by just saying it. We probably have never seen the light from one of those stars out there, just the light that he had allowed to travel along the path that the light would go once it started moving. And so you look at this disruption, he will disrupt that light, and there won't be any light. I think also the atmosphere is going to be seriously, probably poisoned, but there's going to be serious things that have happened to it during this seven-year period. I think they did. I don't know the results yet. We'll see. Now, Now this prophet is going to go back to talking about Babylon again at the end of this. And he says some things will happen. Now this is the Babylon during the tribulation period. All foreigners, when these things start to happen, will flee the city. They will get out of there because they know something is going to happen. The inhabitants of Babylon are going to die a violent death. And God will allow a crime spree to occur. In Babylon. What kind of crime spree? Well, number one, infanticide. Infants are going to be killed. And uh, you remember when we read it, what does it say? Anyone who is found, uh, and little ones also, will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Now, I want you to think about this. We are reading that. What is Isaiah doing? He is seeing it. There's going to be looting and plundering. He's seeing that, and there's rape, and he's going to see that. Now, is this all in repayment? For what this final Babylon has done? And the answer is yes. You can look in Psalm 137, starting in verse 8. It says, O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, how blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the ones who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. That sounds awfully strong to me. But that's how God wrote it, through the pen of the psalmist. Now, let's look at the last uh, five verses here in Isaiah, starting verse 17. Behold, I am going to stir up. Now he's going back here uh, to the Babylon at the time of Daniel. Behold, I am going to stir up the Medes against them, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. Their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there, but desert creatures 
creatures will lie down there, and their house will be filled with owls, and ostriches will live there, and shaggy goats will frolic there, and hyenas will howl in their fortified towers, and jackals in their luxurious places, and her fateful time also will soon come, and her days will not be prolonged. That's speaking about this punishment of Babylon following the invasion by the Medes and the Persians. Now, some people say, it doesn't even say Persians in there, it just said Medes. Well, who became the king of uh, Babylon uh, after this victory? Nope. You find that, I believe, in chapter 6, Darius, the Mede. Exactly right. Darius, the Mede. Now, I find in here a list of five results of the invasion brought about by the Lord God. The first result will be the unrent, unrelenting display of savagery, even showing, not even showing mercy towards children and infants. And so there's going to be this unrelenting uh, display of savagery when it comes. The second will be the destruction of the city itself. The third result the land will be ruined either for grazing or the growing of produce, he says, in and around Babylon. You're not going to even want to bring your animals over there. Now, the fourth is really interesting, and I want you to see. Babylon will have a new set of inhabitants. Basically, solitary desert animals and wild goats. Did you see that passage on wild goats? Uh, I was looking at these words. Why use, I thought, why use wild to describe the goats? Just goats, there's, just like hyenas. You don't say wild hyenas and wild jackals. And then I looked at it, and I want to show you what I found, and you can make your own decisions about what this is talking about. This word wild, or, or entity wild goats, is one word, sawyer. We get a word from that in our uh, language, satire or satyr. But let me talk. The word originally meant hairy, meaning an animal that was, had great amounts of fur. Then it became to mean either a he goat or a buck. Then the meaning came to be a, a satire, which may refer to a demon possessed goat a demon possessed goat now this is just out of the lexicon right now now wait I'm not sure that Elon Musk can, can send demons uh, unless, you're, unless he's Satan well, the dance they but, have now they have they very well may in Greek mythology, a satire was one class of lustful, drunken woodland gods that were represented by a man with horse's ears and tail. In the Roman representation, it was goats, goats' ears, tail, legs, and horns. Now, why would I even bring that up? There, is there anything biblical to support such a consideration even, to even think about it? Well... As I was looking, I found something in Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 7. They shall no longer sacrifice their sac sacrifices to the goat demons with which they play the harlot. This will be a permanent statue uh, to them throughout their generations. Goat demons. So they were, if this is God's word, that means goats in, inhabiting, uh, either inhabiting, pardon me, demons either inhabiting goats or creatures that appeared like goats who were demonic. Well, that's what the Bible says. And it says, that's not to be allowed in your land. That was probably something the Amorites were doing before they got there. And God said, this is worthy of death. Now, look down in Revelation chapter 18 too. And, then I, I will, and he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and a prison for every unclean spirit 
and a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. David? Well, it may be, because we've seen Jesus transfer demons from people into pigs. But the fact is, there's a lot of stuff, I believe, that goes on that we don't really know that much about, and that are hidden. And uh, maybe even some stuff going on in our nation that, well, let's not get started on that. There's a fifth and final result of this invasion of Babylonia, and that once God begins his judgment of Babylon, there is no delay in his execution. It will be quick. Now, we think, man, God is slow. Not by the way he looks at things. We just wish he would hurry up because we want to see retribution. We want to see sin eliminated from our nation. But God has a time and it's going to come. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about before we finish today and then we'll be done this word Babylon, as used throughout the biblical record, is also used sometimes to apply to the totality of the Gentile world powers. Uh, you look at the dream, starting in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 and 31, and ending with this fifth world empire, uh, or maybe just a continuation of the four. Let me give you a picture of that. You see, this is the the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, that God showed him this image in a dream. And it starts with the head of gold, which was Babylon, then the arms and chest of silver, Persia, the abdomen and lower torso of bronze, which represents Greece, and then the legs uh, which represent, of iron, which represent Rome. Now, the feet were different than the legs in that they were part iron and part clay. Now, the question is, is this a, each one of these divisions represented an empire, a world empire. Is this, these feet different from the legs, or are they part of the legs? Now, if so, we know that Rome no longer rules the world, and yet these feet are going to be the final part of this ruling function. And uh, so they're either a continuation of this fourth that comes back, just like Babylon did. Or there's something new. But those are going to be the rulers of the world at the final time in which the Antichrist will sit as the common ruler of all ten, let's just say ten toes. That's going to be the toes empire. It's like this is the head empire. And they are going to be ruling. If you look in Daniel, there's an interesting statement in there. I can't remember whether it's verse 34, 39, somewhere in there. And the seed of men will be mixed. And I think it's talking about um, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, as Satan makes his last comeback. Now, the other thing it talks about here, there's going to be a stone. And that stone is going to be cut out out of the side of a mountain. And it's going to be cut out without hands which means it's an act of God. And this stone is going to be hurled at the statue. Now, it would seem to me that if you're going to hurl a stone at a statue to kill that statue, I would aim for the head. But it's not aimed for the head. You would think then if you can't choose the head, you'd choose the chest. And let's hit the chest. That's where the heart is. But no, that's not where it goes. It is going directly, go back, Go back, right to the feet is where it's aimed at. And when it hits that feet, what will happen, Eddie? It's going to be the whole statute is coming down. And everything about these world empires will fail. Those feet are the final empire uh, of this. And we need to understand, it may look bad now, but I believe the stone is on its way. And its final victory always belongs to our Lord and Master. We have chosen the right side. When they come in the end of chapter 6 of Revelation to realize why, where judgment's coming from, they're going to mourn because they chose the wrong side.
That's the first thing I want you to see. Now, second, do you remember when we talked about those blackouts, darkness on the whole face of the earth? The darkness at these pivotal times pictures the darkness of the world without their Savior Jesus. And when will it be darkest, the darkest time ever in the world? During the day of the Lord, the tribulation. And they are also going to provide the perfect backdrop to see the light of His presence when He comes back for us. Now, you need to understand, when He comes back at the end of that tribulation period, He won't be coming back for us. Why is that? Because we will be coming back with Him. He will have already raptured us, taken us, stolen us away, so we don't have to go through that terrible time. Unless, unless, and this is very important, if you haven't listened to anything I've said up to now, just listen to this. He is not coming back for you if you haven't come to the point in your life where, number one, you recognize that God loves you, but that you have sin, and your sin has permanently separated you from God. And there is nothing you can do to restore that separation by yourself. But God loving you and seeing that sent His Son Jesus to become a man on the earth so that He could die. And He died for you because He loves you. Now I can tell you, I probably wouldn't die for you because my love's not that strong for you. But it was for him. He loved you so much. Now, I can't understand that love. Because you think about it. Who else did he die for? He died for Adolf Hitler. How can you die for Adolf Hitler? One of the most despicable persons to ever live. Probably inhabited most of his life by Satan. But he did. However, recognizing those three things, that God loves you, that your sin has separated you from God, but that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin is not enough. Satan knows those things. His demons know those things. You have to individually receive Jesus as your Savior. Now, we know that in Revelation, uh, pardon me, in uh, John 1, 12, it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even though that believed on his name. It's all about His grace and your faith. You've got to trust in Him. Place your life into trust for Him. If you don't do that, very likely you're going to go through this seven-year tribulation period. And you're going to see all the horror and the things that we've described here, depending on how long you make it. You may not make it very long. Everybody's going to, half the world's going to die during that seven years. Do you want to be in that half? In fact, it might be better on you if it did. But be that as it may, don't let that happen to you and those you love. Instead, receive Him as your Savior. Be born again. You can do that. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, they may. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we could spend studying your word, seeing these prophecies that you have made, understanding what it is that you have done, what it is that you're saying is going to happen, even though it hadn't happened yet. We can rest assured that it will. And we want to thank you today that we don't have to go through that, that we belong to you, and we can look forward to your coming back for us, meeting us in the air and taking us back home with you to spend seven years in the wedding feast of the Lamb. Father, please come soon. But if there's anyone who hasn't made a decision, help them to understand that time is coming real soon. And if it comes, their decision will be made by their inactivity. I pray these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Do we have any questions? All right. St uh, Rena does right back there. We need sound. <laughs>